We'll start recording now. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the uh, astronomy section of the Rochester Academy of Science January virtual meeting. Appreciate everybody being here and I appreciate all the help I had to, to get this going as my power went out. So thanks David and David to uh, get this thing up and running and thanks Peter for hosting me in your kitchen for, for the, tonight's party, tonight's party, tonight's get together. So thanks for coming everybody. And uh, I did invite the, uh, the folks from the Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society to join me, MVAS, Astronomical Society, yes, to join us. I don't know if anybody from that organization is on, but uh, hopefully, welcome folks. So first I must thank Dave Pesch and his company for uh, helping us by donating this service. We've been uh, online with Dave since last April and virtually had meetings every month since then. So that's it's been a great service for us. Thank you very much once again, David, for making that happen. Um, so here's how this works. If um, if it gets noisy, if you have a, if you have a hot mic, I'll probably mute you. Uh, please don't be offended. If you want to speak, all you got to do is unmute yourself. Everybody can unmute themselves. You don't get permanently muted. Um, so just unmute yourself if you need to speak. Uh, of course, you always have chat available. That's to the left. There's a little uh, rectangle at the bottom on the left next to who's here. Uh, feel free to chat to everybody. If you want to chat to somebody directly, you can do that. Uh, once uh, our speaker, Ranga, starts talking, uh, I would ask you to chat me directly with questions for him, and I'll, I'll uh, interrupt him at an appropriate moment to ask those questions if you want to, if they're important to talk to during his talk. Um, if you're on, it's always best to talk with a headset. If you're going to be a, a, a talker at, on this uh, this platform, you, it's, it's a lot easier to keep track of what's going on if you have a headset on. You don't have any background noise and echoing going on as well. So best to use a headset. All right, so here's our agenda. So I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we'll have some announcements. And then our feature talk is by Ranga Diaz. He's a professor of mechanical engineering and physics at the University of Rochester. And if you've read recently, there was uh, – a breakthrough in superconductivity in uh, superhydrides at high pressure. So we'll have Ranga talk a little bit about superconductivity and uh, the nature of uh, the discovery that they made recently. All right, so I want to thank the uh, Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society if you're here. And uh, we actually were able to share an event with them. I saw a number of uh, astronomy section people at their meeting last month. And hopefully we can continue this sharing our, our meeting services with each other. It's nice to have a, a little more activity that we can share with each other. So thanks, uh, thanks to them for doing that. Is there anybody here who this is their first time at a, a meeting besides Ranga? This is obviously your first time here. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anybody else? This is the first time you've been to a, an astronomy section meeting. I'm looking at the names. These all look like the uh, usual suspects over here. So welcome, everybody. Glad to see you. How about observing? It's been really cloudy. I I, I think I saw on, uh, I don't think, I think it was Channel 13. It was Scott Hetzko on Channel 13. And last night's news show that out of the last 38 days, we had three days of clear skies, three days. All the rest of the days were cloudy in the last 38. So observing has been at a real premium <laughs> of late. So uh, anybody doing it? I know that uh, I showed a couple pictures on our slide here of the uh, conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter that uh, Rick Albrecht captured in Georgia, not here in Rochester. Uh, Peter Blackwood caught a nice image of the uh, of a moon halo. I think that was last week, and I think he published that in our newsletter as well. As well, anybody be able to do any observing besides uh, the moon of late? Mark, uh, this is uh, Tom Yale. Hey, Tom. Uh, I've got a, a Celestron. A uh, scout. You know what a, a scout looks like? Is that the little box that you can kind of find things in the sky? Yeah. Uh, what Celestron has done is it it's programmed itself so it can interact with uh, uh, what is it, the 
place in England where they can transmit longitude and latitude according to the hour. Um, but with the scout, all you got to do is point it at something, and it'll come back with. Uh, what is it? It's, it's not uh, Norwich, England, is it? What is it called? It's something like that. Uh, Greenwich, Greenwich, England. Greenwich. Paula has a scout. Yeah. She's showing us her Sky Scout. It's so kind of a cool tool. So what's happened is uh, the Scout uh, kind of ended its uh, programmability by running out the time. For instance, uh, I don't get 2020 anymore. It goes up to 2019. Also, the hardware is, exp is uh, the firmware is, is expired. Is there a way to update the firmware? So I called them, and they said uh, they no longer service. And I was wondering if anybody in the club has any way of determining the program in there needed to change it to 2021 or 22. I don't know where to go with it. Otherwise, I have to junk it. And it's such a fun thing for my grandchildren. It's a cool tool. I have one myself. Um, I didn't realize that it uh, it it's expired. You know, it shouldn't take much to update the firmware in that thing, but they're not offering any support for it, huh? Right. right. I don't know which way to go with it. Uh, Paula Santoraco wrote writes down here in the uh, chat that she looked on the internet. And there's some workarounds to imitate the current date. So maybe we'll have to look more online. I have one too, but I haven't used it in a while. Okay. Uh, what was her name again? Maybe I can write it down. It's if you're uh, if you're on, you can see in the public chat Paula Santaraco. Hi, Paula. Paula. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Tony's one of the few that saw some geminids. You saw 17 meteors in a couple hours. That's pretty cool. The day before. That's awesome. Well, one of my problems is I haven't been able to get any stars out in the sky to see them. Okay, yeah. No. But, the, but the scout will tell you where they are through the clouds. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you know where they are, just not, just can't see them. Satellite <laughs> frost, so that you can interact with that satellite. Okay. Well, Gary, Gary says that Cloudy Nights might have a few threads on that scout firmware, so check Cloudy Nights. Source for uh, for information. Okay. I, I didn't catch everything you were saying. Oh, uh, if you if you look into the public chat, Gary says says cloudy nights has a few threads, a few uh, 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 conversations about uh, the firmware for the scout. <laughs> And that's a good uh, that's a good source for that stuff. So. Uh, Audionets.com. It's all sorts of echoing, and I can't make out what you're saying. I'll uh, I'll email it to you after the meeting. A place to look for it. I'll have to talk some other time. Uh, I'll uh, I'll talk to you after the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Jeff saw the conjunction. Yeah, I saw an evening. Uh, you saw it on the on the twenty first, Jeff. I saw it on the eighteenth. It was still pretty far apart. The eighteenth. All right, let's move on. Uh, so it is time to renew your membership. Everybody's membership expired if you haven't renewed yet on the on uh, the thirty first. So to keep current for twenty twenty one. Use uh, there's a there's a couple ways to do it. There's a form on our site in the newsletter, and and there's also instructions on how to use PayPal to uh, renew your membership for 2021. If you if you hold a key to the site, so for some of the buildings, whether it's one key or a key to a couple of specialized buildings, those are also due to renew. Uh, for those interested in keys to become a first time key holder, it costs $25. You need to be been a member in good standing for two years or talk to the board of directors. Either way, you still have to talk to the board of directors to get access uh, to keys. 
to unlock buildings at the site. And that, that gives you the ability to uh, open up uh, the domes, the roll-offs, and uh, use the equipment that's inside. Certainly anyone can come to use the site anytime they want. You can uh, borrow scopes from our loaner collection. You don't need a key to do that kind of stuff. But uh, it, uh, that's a nice perk uh, once you're a member for a while to have a key to the site to use the buildings at your leisure. And it is a beautiful site. There's a lot of, a lot of things we can do there. And once it starts to get warm, actually we have, we have open houses once a month, but once it starts to get warm, it's a whole lot easier to go around, check out those buildings and learn how to use the, the equipment that's inside there. So, uh, membership chair is, is Bill Rogers. His email is there if you have any questions on renewing. Uh, certainly you can mail it in, but we prefer to use PayPal. And uh, there's, there's fees along with PayPal to cover the, the charges that PayPal charges. Us. That stuff is in the newsletter and uh, certainly on our site and the website's right there. Um, so virtual star parties, I had hoped to have another one this month uh, with the uh, with the conjunction as, uh, as kicking that off, but I was not able to get good images of the conjunction. I did take some images, I think, of... Uh, of Saturn, Jupiter and Saturn, they didn't come out real well because they were very low in the sky. It's really, really bad. So what I think we're going to do is, if, if it's not before we uh, convert it back, we'll have another star party, but I'd like to convert the, uh, the C-14 that you see there over on the right, convert that back to its uh, hyperstar configuration because it's a much more forgiving setup in hyperstar to do imaging, and uh, it's a lot easier to find stuff when we're set up that way. So I'd like to get that converted back to the Hyperstar setup, and then we'll uh, we'll do another star party because it's a, uh, I find it a lot easier to do the star parties that way. So look forward to that happening soon. Stay tuned for notice by email on uh, another virtual star party. And eventually I'd like to try to do them live. So doing them doing a star party live would be pretty cool. And we can even, you know, with any experience, if you've got the objects that you'd like to see that we can, we can, uh, we can slew to, that would be a fun thing to do as well. So hopefully we can do some of that as well. Bill likes my hat. He's got one just like it, but his is black. Uh, open house, so the next open house is January 23rd. That's Sunday from uh, 12 to four uh, at the Ferris Center. Uh, and I have, uh, we'll be using proto COVID COVID protocols there. We would have an, a, a member observing probably tomorrow but it's going to be the possibility it'll be somewhat somewhat clear, at least partly cloudy skies. Uh, but it's going to be about 19 degrees in Ionia tomorrow. So I'm, if you want to go, go out and have a great time. But I'm I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm I'm not gonna brave it myself. It's a little too cold for me. Uh, it's possible that we do it the following weekend, but it looks like we're going to get snow uh, towards the end of next week. So I don't know that uh, next week is going to be that good. But feel free. If it's clear, the site's there for you to use. Please, uh, please feel free to use the site. So for the open house and for any other event, uh, I'm going to make this a little wider so we can see this. So these are the protocols when you, we use the site. And this was going to be our member observing the 9th or the 16th, all weather dependent. But it doesn't look good for this weekend. When you come in, there is a, uh, at the door that's by the ramp, uh, there is a table and you sign in upon arrival if, if we're having a group there in case we need to contact uh, you for tracing who you've been in contact with if we have a, a, an active case of the coronavirus. Uh, there are wipes and sanitizers right there by the sign-in sheet and also in the, the kitchen and each of the bathrooms. Um, ensure there's six feet between people. Anytime that you're less than six feet apart, you have to wear acceptable face coverings, face masks. You've been wearing them all the time when you go out to go shopping for food or whatever. The building is, is occupancy is under 50%, which is uh, which would be 30 people. Our occupancy is 60, so 30, no more than 30 people inside the Wolf Education Building, and no more than four people in each of the two big roll-offs. The smaller buildings, you really don't want to have more than one person in at a time, but the, the two big roll-offs, no more than four. Um, there, one bathroom is closed. This is an old, I just should have updated this. The upstairs bathroom is closed, but the downstairs bathroom, the door is closed. 
but it's oh the bathroom is usable just uh there's a heater inside there that keeps that bathroom and all of our uh, facilities uh warm so that uh, things don't freeze over uh, if you use that bathroom just feel free to use the bathroom but make sure you close the door when you're done using it to keep uh, keep all utilities from freezing um in either case uh, wipe the faucets and handles with the disinfecting wipes before and after you use them. They wipe the toilet seats if you use it or you handle it. And before and after use, then dispose of the wipes in the trash can. We don't have a, uh, we're on a septic system there, so appreciate if you put the uh, any wipes in the trash can that you would use to wipe down surfaces. Wash your hands. If you're out there after dark, please uh, use red lights and uh, have fun for those events, especially the, uh, the, the uh, open houses. Yeah, Mark, I expect electricity to be back in an hour, so it's probably back now. It just didn't uh, didn't, didn't work for me. <laughs> uh, we'll have a board of directors meeting on Wednesday next week uh, from 7 to 9. Uh, we'll use the same platform. We, have, we use a different room. I have a password to get into that room. If uh, you're interested in attending, let me know. I'll send you a link to the meeting. Any member is, uh, is welcome to attend the board meeting. So uh, feel free to do that. Just let me know that you want to attend. I'll send you a link and password to join that meeting. Uh, we've started a telescope inquiry group. I think I showed this last month. And uh, I think we've kind of, we all enjoyed our holidays. And so we're kind of on, haven't proceeded much farther than we had. Uh, certainly welcome to have more people join us. But uh, as the slide here says, we're forming a group of people to help uh, public address questions on telescopes, such as how do I set up my scope? I, I got a scope, I think it's missing parts, or I don't know how to use it, can you help me? And then the, the one we get a lot is I want to buy a scope, and which one should I buy for my son, my daughter, husband, wife? And that's a very personal question, and, and a lot of questions need to be answered to figure out what kind of telescope you want to buy. Sometimes it's not even a telescope. Sometimes you do want to get a pair of binoculars instead of a telescope. So. Uh, that's uh, this scope. This group would be uh, the group to contact to uh, answer those questions. So Ken wants to know if you, have, if you have to follow this protocol after we got ourselves vaccinated. Well, we'll find out what those protocols are from the state. But I'm certain that uh, well, we want we all want to know that we are protected from each other as far as. Uh, uh, acquiring or giving the virus. So we would certainly still be doing using those protocols after you get vaccinated. Yes. All right, so February, this is our speaker for February is Carol Higgins. She's a NASA solar system ambassador and she's also a member of the Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society. And it's basically all about the James Webb Telescope, uh, what it's, you know, its development, what it's going to be sent up to do, when it's going. And uh, I look forward to this talk on Friday, February 5th um, from uh, Carol Higgins. So the telescope it would be a virtual meeting. Uh, yes, it will, Mark. Yes, well, we're forming a group, but certainly when people need help, you'll be able to contact that group by email, and then you can have, you can have a, uh, a conversation by email or by a phone, whatever, to, uh, to get, things, get things going. Tony, uh, Tony had uh, something related to the vaccine. His uh, understanding is that it doesn't fully kick in until a week after a person receives the second dose. Yeah, there's a, the fact the vaccine's out is a great story, but there's more to come. Yeah, we we really want to be want to be careful to make sure that you know, we are following every precaution that nobody is exposed. And certainly, somebody somebody getting a vaccine is, is great for them personally, but as a as a group, we really aren't, aren't going to be anywhere near what they call herd immunity when we're all in good shape. Till late next year, I would think, or this year, late this year. So we're we're going to be a while. All right. Any more questions on uh, our protocols? The uh, meet upcoming meetings, 
or the uh, speaker next next month. All right. All right. So let me welcome uh, Ranga Diaz from uh, University of Rochester, uh, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Physics. And what I will do, Ranga, is I will promote you to make you the presenter. So now you can share your screen and your uh, presentation. Thanks, Ranga. You're welcome. All right, let's see. Um... I would ask anybody else now to turn off your webcam. Let's leave Ranga's cam on and everybody else's cam off. Right. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Perfect. Yes. Okay. There. So uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the, uh, give, uh, talk about my recent research uh, on superconductivity. Um, and uh, I very much enjoy uh, listening to the uh, yeah, the society at uh, the astronomical events that uh, you were discussing. Uh, uh, when I was a student uh, back in Sri Lanka, uh, I used to be in the astronomy club too, and uh, you know, uh, go into this astronomy events. Um, but the, the 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 research direction changed uh, after I came to uh, US, and now more into a uh, candis metaphysics. So I hope my talk uh, I try to uh, keep it very simple and uh, try to somehow uh, relate it to the um, astronomy uh, as well, the planetary science. Um, so. Uh, what I'm going to discuss is the about the, the recent development on, on superconductivity. Um, so this is based on the uh, our recent paper published in Nature. Uh, it's it's in the Nature cover, uh, discussing about the uh, uh, room temperature superconductivity. Um, the reason I put this uh, cover image here is that uh, uh, when we get to know that the Nature selected uh, our paper to be in their uh, uh, cover, the actual design we came up with this uh, uh, in our group. Um, like uh, they go with the theme of the Ghostbusters, uh, like saying that the resistance is busted uh, uh, because in superconductivity uh, you will not see any resistance in those materials. Um, just to uh, uh, sort of give you the idea that what uh, the superconductivity means. But the nature said that this is too comical to uh, use in a, in a scientific journal. But I, I thought it was it was a funny uh, cover to uh, have it. Um, so we have all the, uh, in our group now T-shirts uh, with this uh, so that uh, we can uh, remember what we uh, came up with uh, uh, for the nature cover. Okay, so this is my team uh, that we're working on this uh, research. Um, uh, again, I mean, this research is a teamwork and uh, my students and postdocs uh, work really hard to uh, 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 work on these uh, experiments and uh, obtain these uh, uh, very um, high quality data and then analyzing them and, uh, you know, of course, uh, coming up with the new ideas. So I want to make sure that uh, they get the full credit for this, uh, this work and uh, acknowledge them uh, uh, providing all these uh, uh, experiments. Okay, so since we are, uh, so the, these experiments, the, all these uh, discussion that I'm going to go through in this uh, uh, presentation is, is, is uh, based on the pressure. Um, so in our research lab, we work on the um, materials or uh, uh, any given uh, uh, experiment is under pressure. So we go away from the atmospheric pressure and then uh, put any material to a really high pressures and see what kind of uh, 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 impact or what kind of a property change or what kind of structural change uh, can happen. So this it's sort of like a, the the uh, the theme of the uh, research is that the how materials behave under pressure. So since we are talking about the pressure, I thought of starting with the <laughs> unit we are using. So the the very common unit we are using in here is the gigapascal, which is uh, you know equal to the ten thousand bar or roughly give or take is. Uh, 10,000 atmosphere, and then you will see some uh, horrible English units. Uh, I'm going to put the here, nobody's using. Uh, and also, another uh, unit that we use is a mega bar, which is equal to 100 giga uh, Pascal. So, this give you an idea of uh, you know uh, what kind of a pressure range that we are uh, talking about. And just to get a feeling of the, it is that you know we know the 
the the center of uh, the pressure is roughly you know we are we able to get a good estimation is 3.6 million atmosphere or 360 uh, gigapascal and if you think of the way that you know if you go from a one atmosphere to a let's say 3.6 million atmosphere it's enormous amount of pressure what could happen to a material will they exist as you know the ambient condition uh, state or will it be totally different or what, what how you can imagine uh, what could happen into a uh, material. In a simple term, I, I would say that um, easily, when you increase the pressure, if you look at this graph, this is the pressure, and this is uh, represent the interatomic distance. Uh, even though material, you know, they're in the atomic scale, there are a lot of empty space in, in, in that uh, world. So when you pressurize it, in a general term, you can think of that there are a lot of empty space, those atoms are getting closer and closer together. So you sort of squeezing the the uh, 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 volume between those uh, atoms or molecules, so you, so that you're reducing the uh, volume. So you will see uh, easily that uh, volume decrease when you go from a uh, one atmosphere to a really high pressure. For example, 3.6 million atmospheres. So for example, solid hydrogen uh, can have fourfold decreasing in uh, volume. Hard metal like iron, two-folded, water, three, and alkaline metal like uh, five-folded. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the very basic idea that, okay, so when you squeeze the material, definitely there's a lot of empty space, your volume going to decrease. And which means that you probably, your state of matter at that ambient condition may not be the same uh, at these uh, conditions. Um, one example that I wanted to share is that, because everybody used this one very um, uh uh, very well in, in this research is diamond. If you take carbon, the most stable form of carbon at ambient conditions is graphite, which you see you know, you're in pencil, you can uh, you use it in day-to-day -day -day life. But if you pressurize this carbon uh, to a little bit of higher temperature, you make diamond. And if you release the pressure, this diamond doesn't go back to carbon or graphite. It stays in the diamond form. So you see now you're making a new type of material, but the same building block of the, uh, using the carbon, but a different arrangement of the crystal structure, but it has a different properties. And it doesn't really go back, at least in our lifetime, we haven't seen diamond decay back to uh, carbon or, or graphite. So there are some mechanisms, some, uh, uh, something going on, uh, this kind of material. So here we go, so ambient condition, you have graphite, this is high pressure conditions. You make diamond, you release the uh, uh, pressure, but it doesn't go back to the uh, graphite or carbon. So it stays as, as diamond. So there, there must have must, must be some reason behind this, why these are stable um, at these kind of conditions. And when you release the pressure, it doesn't really go back to uh, original form. Most of them are do, but uh, there are some other ex uh, some exceptional uh, sample uh, materials that doesn't really uh, goes back. So which sort of give you an idea that pressure can really do a lot of changes into a material and we can make something like a new material. Think of this way, in astronomical world, probably you can think, think that you are in a different planet. Your ambient conditions now is di different. So Earth, you have an atmosphere and 300 degrees uh, uh, Kelvin is, as your room uh, uh, pressure condition, temperature and pressure conditions. But if you go to Mars, it's totally different. If you go to Jupiter, it's totally different. Uh, conditions and Saturn or Sun, so the the materials, the chemicals, or molecules or compound, it doesn't really behave the way that we know at these uh, Earth uh, ambient conditions. So in a way that you know you're trying to see uh, how we can make a new material using pressure as your tool, uh, and then uh, uh, see what kind of new properties you can uh, extract from these uh, materials. So then, um, so then the next question is that how we can generate the pressure and temperature conditions that are similar to uh, interior of a planet. Um, so there are two ways that we can generate high pressures. Uh, one device that we use is called diamond annular cell. So this schematic shows you the diamond annular cell geometry. So you have two anvils sitting opposite to each other and you put a metal gasket in between, you pre-ended this area, you see, and then you drill a small hole uh, in this uh, uh, metal gasket, and that small area is going to be the your sample chamber. So we call this tip of this diamond is culet, and the other side is a table. And all we do is that it's a very simple device. You mechanically apply force 
uh, from the top and bottom diamond, and then we try to squeeze this material in between the two diamonds to higher pressures. In a simple terms, pressure is force divided by area. So the smaller the area you go, the higher the pressure you can uh, achieve. So depending on the cuvelet size, the tip of this diamond, you can vary the pressure uh, that you can achieve. Um, in our experiment, um, we usually go up to a 500 gigapascal. Uh, we're using the diamond and we sell. It's more than the pressure of the center of uh, Earth. So the, the material that we know at ambient conditions doesn't really exist in these uh, uh, conditions. So this is one way we can generate high pressure. We call it um, static compression because this way you have all the time in you in the world that you, to uh, study the material. Because diamond is transparent, so you can see through this diamond. You can shine a laser light. You can shine any other. You can apply any other uh, uh, technique uh, to characterize the mat uh, uh, material's properties, X-ray or uh, even neutron diffraction, anything you wanted to do, you, you can try through this uh, material as well. Uh, so this is why diamond and cell in that sense is a little bit uh, um, uh, special because you have a, a lot of opportunities to characterize this material. And then the other way of doing it is the using a shock wave. So this is why Rochester is very famous is because of the laser lab, uh, uh, LLE, you have this uh, laser that you use to shock a material to, so that you can go to really high pressure. We call it dynamic uh, compression. So in that way, we go to a really higher pressures. But one drawback is, is we are talking about a very short time scale, femtosecond to microsecond. So it's a quick process and also you have a large increase in, in temperature. So um, the time that you have to study the material is very limited in that sense. Uh, but you can have a really uh, bigger samples. The diamond and cell, on the other hand, the problem is that your sample size is going to be really small depending on the pressure you wanted to uh, go. For example, if you wanted to reach 500 gigapascal, you need a size of a cubelet uh, about uh, 30 micron uh, in diameter. So it's really small sample uh, compared to the, the dynamic compression. But these two are, you know, goes together. So you uh, really uh, use both techniques to, depending on the uh, uh, PT condition that you wanted to study, uh, you, you're going to uh, end up using it. So I uh, use both these techniques. Um, then, so let's see how we can understand uh, what can happen to a material when you subject to really high pressures. So I'm going to use this uh, example uh, showing in this picture. This is a subway compartment. So uh, this is a non-rush hour. So there's only three people sitting in this. There's a lot of empty seats and empty space in this subway compartment. Think of this as, as your a fixed volume and the people inside this subway compartment as the number of people inside is similar to the number of particles or atoms or molecules in your system in your material then if you go from non rush hour to the let's say liberal rush hour not as five o'clock but you know getting getting crowded now all of a sudden there are a lot of people around you um there are some people standing next to you sitting next to you and then now all of a sudden you can see that there are, you can you know start interacting right you can talk to the uh, the, the person uh, next to you or standing or you can discuss uh, anything or you know, ask the phone number or so. so more interaction right so sort of like your code the number of coordination is sort of increased here this person sitting by himself all of a sudden then they have more people around you you start to interact uh, more you can think of this the same way in actual pressure experiment your number of atoms are fixed, you're reducing the volume. But uh, here I'm keeping the volume fixed and the adding people as the number of uh, atoms. It's the same uh, concept. So when you squeeze them, you're getting close to other atoms or molecules or compound in your material. So now that you may be able to make a new bond that was not there before at ambient condition because now you're getting closer to each other. You can interact, you can share your electrons. Uh, you know, you, the, the, these kind of all these crazy things starting to uh, happen when you uh, increase uh, increase pressure. Then, if you go really rush hour, so it's going to be really packed, and there's a lot of you know empty space is squeezed out, and then you have small number of you know there's almost empty, um, there's no empty uh, space there. And I'm using this uh, picture. This is from a subway compartment in Boston. That day, uh, people. Right, that uh, subway compound without their pants. They call it no pants day 
but I thought it was a very interesting picture to use because in a pressure experiment, if you really squeeze material hard enough, the electrons can rip apart from your nucleus and then, uh, you know, get localized. So that can give rise to all crazy uh, uh, behaviors uh, in a given material. Just to represent that, I thought uh, no pants means, you know, your pants go on the same way the electrons are ripping apart from your atom and uh, localizing it just to uh, mimic that uh, I'm using this uh, uh, picture. And also if you go to the, you know, the, this is sort of like a, a rule in high pressure. But of course, if you go to India, those rules doesn't really uh, work. You know, people are outside the train. This is, this is not possible. Your number of volume and uh, people were only supposed to be inside the volume compartment, but it goes uh, uh, different. Um, but then if you go goes to um, uh, Tokyo subway, you see that people are pushing in to get into the train. So this is like, you can think of this as another way of uh, uh, pressurizing it. So there was an idea uh, that uh, in, in the high pressure community is that you can use uh, other material in a given uh, lattice to, instead of mechanically, you know, applying force to bring the atoms together, maybe adding a bigger atom into the system can force some other material to atom to come closer and then have a uh, same effect as you are mechanically pressing it. I mean, think of it it's this way. So if you're sitting in your room, one way to squeeze your space, uh, you know, the empty space that you can bring your four walls closer together. So you lose your space there. Or if you put 10 people inside you, uh, inside your room, so you start to feel a little bit squeezed. And then let's say if you're a football fan, uh, uh, Bills are doing really well, let's say um, you're gonna put uh, 10 defensive linemen. So there's 300 pound big uh, uh, people and then you're definitely gonna feel really squeezed, right? But so think of that way that you can maybe add some new material uh, with a bigger radius may feel uh, differently in a given uh, environment. So just to represent that I'm using this picture that you, it's, it's like you're hiring somebody to uh, squeeze everything into the uh, tight uh, uh, space. So, so, so then if you go from these kind of, you know, let's say one atmosphere to 3.6 million atmosphere, or even higher than uh, that, the materials that we know at ambient condition doesn't really exist the way it should. For example, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. But if you subject to really high pressures, these are the synthetic conditions. This carbon dioxide bond has double bonded oxygen. It break this bond and become a single bonded, just like a diamond structure, uh, a CO2 uh, uh, structure. And interestingly enough, this material is have totally different properties and it's optically nonlinear. What I meant by is that it has a very um, different response to a, any optical input. For example, if you shine the 1064 la uh, laser line to this uh, nanometers uh, laser line to into this material, you get the green light out. So at 1064 infrared, you don't see it, but as soon as you shine that laser light, you get the 532 nanometer laser light coming out of the uh, sample. So this is what the picture shows you, that this is the sample and then you shine the uh, laser, green, um, uh, IR laser, you see this lot of green light uh, coming out, it's optically nonlinear. And this is also a very high energy density material. So out of green, green greenhouse gas, you make some new material which has totally different uh, properties. Then oxygen, we all know, and then if you subject to these high pressure conditions, it become a metal, and then also it can become a superconducting material uh, as well. So you see this beautiful scarlet uh, uh, oxygen at these high pressure uh, conditions. And then if you take a material, simple material like uh, gas uh, nitrogen, and nitrogen is, has the strongest triple bond. But if you subject to really high pressures, you break this triple bond nitrogen and become a single bonded nitrogen. Then all of a sudden you are in a different uh, uh, chemical uh, world. And this is uh, enormous, there's a lot, enormous amount of energy stored in these materials and when you release it, you can get this uh, energy uh, back. It's a high, uh, uh, highly packed, high energy, energy, high density material. So these three examples, I just wanted to show such a way that you see when you apply pressure, the materials become completely different with the different properties, which think of as you're in a different planet, your PT conditions, 
is not as same as that we know uh, on Earth. So, I mean, uh, what we really do is by pressurizing is that you really change the uh, the energy density uh, and the energy landscape of this uh, uh, given uh, material. And then another phenomena is that, so if you take a, let's say, insulator, electrical insulator, which means that you have a band gap, you have a, this is a very simple picture. I'm showing pressure versus energy. Uh, you have a valence band and you have a conduct, uh, con conduction band. So in an insulator, you have a gap. But when you pressurize it, these bands get broad and broad and broad. At some point, they're going to overlap. And that's where you can have insulated metal transition. So which means that you can take an insulator and with pressure, you can make a metal out of it. For example, a xenon is a noble gas. There's no you know, interaction or no chemical bonds. It's an inert gas. But if you pressurize to high enough pressure, uh, for example, 1.3 million atmospheres, it become a metal. So all of a sudden, noble gas become a metallic uh, uh, material. And oxygen, iodine, cesium iodide, those are examples. On, and oxygen, not even just uh, metal, it's, big, it, it's superconducting uh, material as well. So then you, you can think that, you know, if you take any material, if you're subject to really high pressure, you can make a metal out of it. It's the same way hydrogen. Pure hydrogen and ambient condition is a gas. But if you're subject to really high pressures, 500 gigapascal, it becomes a metallic hydrogen. And then in, in you know, it's planetary interiors, that people are thinking in Jupiter, uh, um, uh, like Jupiter, that uh, hydrogen may be, it's in the liquid form, liquid metallic hydrogen. Because if the PT conditions are correct, so you may have uh, uh, very well the metallic hydrogen in these uh, planetary uh, interiors. So you, you will see that, you know, with pressure, the, the properties of a material is dramatically uh, can change. And then, you know, in a, in, a, in a common, you know, in a general sense that you can think of the, any material you're taking and squeeze them to higher pressures, you can definitely make a metal out of it. But that wasn't the case always. Some material goes opposite. Some, when you squeeze them, band gap starting to open instead of uh, uh, closing it. So you all of a sudden, you're getting uh, uh, um, insulated. So this is like a new bonding scheme and that you can think of this as a sort of a new way of uh, studying uh, uh, these uh, uh, materials. So one interesting thing is this uh, uh, pressure is that, as I was saying in the previous slide about the metal and the superconductor, in general, none of the, you know, all the material in the periodic table are not superconducting or any compound that we have to put together may not be superconducting. But with pressure, we can obtain these optimum conditions that can favor for these uh, superconducting uh, transitions. So then people start to use the pressure as your tuning parameter it's, instead of doping it uh, as a way that you can uh, get the right conditions to, for material to have a, a superconducting uh, transition. So what you're seeing here is that the, uh, the recent discoveries of different material which is superconducting under uh, pressures. So this give you us give give gave us an opportunity to explore uh, uh, superconducting materials with high uh, transition uh, temperatures. So let's see why superconducting materials. Why this is uh, interesting, and why we need to uh, get to superconducting uh, uh, need to find a superconducting material. So this happened in 1911 uh, uh, with the discovery of uh, liquid uh, helium. So Camel and Anna, uh, the Dutch physicists, uh, found a way to uh, liquefy helium. So then uh, he was thinking that, okay, what are we going to do with this? Can we study materials properties? So let's see. Let's take a metal and see uh, we can study uh, how metal behaves uh, at low temperatures. Uh, what about the conductivity, you know, electrical resistance? So there were different, different uh, uh, hypotheses, like some say that, or oh, the resistance of a material comes from this vibration of the atoms. Maybe when you cool it down, the atom vibration will freeze and then electrical conductivity resistance goes to zero. Or some may thought that maybe we can have a different uh, localized orbitals, maybe electrical resistance will go up. Uh, some thoughts maybe impurities there, you're not gonna get always a clean material, maybe there's impurities 
maybe you will have a finite uh, uh, resistance. Those are sort of like the uh, different directions that they start to uh, think about. So then with that, they start uh, uh, studying mercury as their first material. And the, what happened when, when they study mercury is that when they cool it down to 4.2 Kelvin, all of a sudden, the resistance, electrical resistance really vanishes. They couldn't really measure it. It was like almost zero. And then as long as you maintain that temperature, you can have this zero resistance state. So this is like a new state of matter which doesn't have any electrical uh, resistance. As I was saying, the electrical resistance comes from, let's say you have a red bows, these are ions, and you have blue electrons. They're vibrating and then they're bouncing each other, you know, bouncing to the other atoms. And then that causes the resistance which generate the heat and then you lose a lot of power. But imagine if there's a material that the electron can pass through without any disturbance, without any bouncing with each other or even with the atom, you just go through uh, uh, smoothly, freely uh, without any resistance. So then you have a zero resistance, so you can save this energy that you lose for uh, resistance. So because of this, these material, superconducting materials are become very uh, technologically important uh, material. So just to show you the uh, uh, what happened in it, if you take the three different materials, let's say you have a conductor, you will have a finite resistance when you cool it down. And if you take a superconductor, you see that resistance goes to zero at some uh, uh, temperature. So we call this as a critical uh, temperature. So the problem is that all these superconductors, superconductors are really low temperatures. 20 Kelvin, 40 Kelvin in terms of Fahrenheit, you know, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, it's, it's not in a you know usable range. So imagine if you ha can have a room temperature superconducting material and the technological impact that you can have to the society. So for example, the power grid system, the, the transmission line that we are using nowadays. So you use these wires and have a huge loss in electrical resistance because of the electrical resistance plus power. So you, imagine you're making superconducting wires instead of uh, these uh, wires that we are using right now, and you save these amount, the huge amount of energy that you lose for uh, uh, heat, and then you you're gonna save in terms of I mean if you look at the, the from the numbers I think per year according to 2018 data, 18 or 17 data, we lose about like a 20 billion dollars per year for these uh, uh, loss for these uh, uh, resistance. Imagine now if you can use this uh, superconductor, right, that th things will be totally different, right? And then the another way of thinking is this uh, superconductors is that the medical side, medical imaging, MRI, even nowadays we are using this one, but there are a lot of cost goes into these cryogenic systems. So if you have a room temperature superconductor, then you can use this, you know, MRI, medical imaging, without these uh, costs that you need to spend for the uh, cryogenics. And they use a helium for this liquid helium, and we are running out of helium in the planet. So these are some needs that we really need uh, to uh, in the future uh, technological developments. And also, on one other property for superconducting material is that when you apply a magnetic field, instead of this field going through the sample, they tend to go around the sample. So this can use as to levitate the material. So which means you can have a frictionless, you know, levitated trains uh, that can travel without any uh, uh, resistance. So you have this levitated, magnetically lev levitated trains with frictionless uh, uh, tracks. So you can have this high speed train and the, which means your transportation can totally be uh, uh, different. So I'm, I'm a fan of this uh, movie, uh, Back to the Future. You can think of maybe the Hoover boards may be uh, possible with the room temperature uh, uh, superconductors. So the the impact that can have for these materials is it's, it's a lot. So uh, because of that, even though this is a low temperature phenomena, for over the last more than a century, people were trying hard to scientists were trying hard to bring the pre, uh, temperature to room temperature so that we can have a uh, uh, impact in the uh, society. So with that, that's where we start uh, working on this material, and we were using. Um, uh, pressure as a tool to achieve these uh, conditions. So the motivation for this uh, research comes with the 
the idea of uh, hydrogen. So just to give a background, um, hydrogen, even though it's a gas at ambient condition, but if you go to higher pressure, just like in the interior of Jupiter, it become a metallic state. And the theoretical calculation shows that metallic hydrogen can be a room temperature superconductor. The simple recipe to be a superconducting is that lighter elements, stronger bonds. So hydrogen has this both criteria easily that can uh, um, uh, use as a favorable uh, case to a superconducting material. But the issue is that to get to hydrogen metal, you need enormous amount of pressure. And these are not very easy experiment going into these high pressure conditions and measuring these properties. So we start to think about how we can mimic the same high pressure metallic hydrogen property, which is one is a room temperature superconductor, but much lower pressures. So if I go back to the one of the slides that I use is chemical pre-compression, the Tokyo subway, adding some, you know, using this, hiring some people to push them in to chemically compress it instead of mechanically pressing it, maybe a way to uh, go for it. So with that idea, we start thinking about so how I can do my hydrogen material with something else, uh, some other material that can uh, mimic the same uh, metallic hydrogen uh, properties. So with that, we were able to come up with the new uh, uh, superconducting materials, which has uh, uh, room temperature properties. So if you look at this graph, this is a number of years and the TC, how that evolved with the, over the years. And you know we found some material around 100, uh, below 200 Kelvin, but nothing really came close to the room temperature. So with this idea of hydrogen being a, a room temperature superconductor, in 2015, a uh, group in uh, Germany found a superconductor 200 Kelvin and 250 Kelvin, so which tells you that we are going in the right direction that uh, can have a room temperature uh, superconductor. So this is where we uh, start to think about this uh, research is that using hydrogen as a building block to get to uh, uh, these uh, superconductor state. These are the different structures that we use to uh, mimic these uh, similar conditions. So one of the interesting material that we come up with is that the yttrium hydride. So yttrium can have a very different uh, stoichiometry, yttrium like YH6, YH10, YH9. So all shows the superconducting properties. What you're seeing in this graph is that the transition temperature uh, with the different uh, chemical uh, uh, compounds. So yttrium right here, YH9, YH10, YH6, happen to come to a close to a room temperature uh, superconductor. So with that, we start studying in this material, but one of the problem with this material is that uh, these are highly reactive. Yttrium is very reactive to work with. Uh, it really reacts with the oxygen and make a yttrium oxide. Then you really not gonna get a chance of yttrium uh, hydride. So we, because of that, we start working on this new technique uh, using the sputtering method. We sputter small uh, metallic surf, um, uh, yttrium onto the diamond, and we we coat this yttrium with the small palladium layer. The palladium is used as a protective layer for the yttrium, and also same time catalytic uh, uh, material to uh, hydrogen to diffuse into the yttrium so that you can make a yttrium uh, hydride. If I show you this animation, so this is your diamond tip. You have electrical leads coming into the, your uh, diamond leads, which you can measure the electrical resistance, which means that you can measure the, the zero resistance state of a superconductor. And then you coat this one with the, here comes yttrium, and here comes small platinum, palladium, and hydrogen. And you close your diamond and whistle, you pressurize to high pressures so that you can save the material from oxidizing. At the same time, uh, you'll be able to use palladium as a, a catalytic uh, material to diffuse hydrogen into the yttrium and make yttrium uh, hydride. So, so what really happened is that, so here, if you look at this uh, zoom view of this image, so you have a yttrium, tiny layer of palladium, you have hydrogen, the hydrogen diffuse in, you make yttrium hydride. YH3 to start with. So you, pure metal is trans, it's opaque, right? But as long as you make YH3, when hydrogen goes into the yttrium, this make this is a transparent material. So I'm going to show you this a series of pictures to prove that 
So here at ambient conditions, this is from the transmitter light. So no light coming through, maybe a little bit, tiny bit here, depending on the thickness of your film. And then as soon as hydrogen comes in, it reacts, you see this, it becomes this opaque area, become transparent yellowish color. So which indicate that you're making yttrium hydride. And then if you take that yttrium hydride, squeeze it to higher pressures, you again see it become darker in yellow and like a sort of orange and get really orange and dark and then get really dark around 50 GPA and then become completely opaque. So which means that visually you are seeing the evidence of it going from an insulator to a metal or semiconductor to a metal. This metal you can't see through, right? So, so you will see that that's transition. Uh, and then this picture shows you that four electrodes that attach to this sample, which you can uh, measure the electrical uh, resistance. So this graph shows you that how this process happened. This is the electrical resistance in a pure yttrium material. As soon as hydrogen start to come in, it react and become a yttrium hydride, you see that electrical resistance goes up goes up and goes up and become a totally different material by H3 plus H2. When you squeeze this material to higher pressures, that's where we start to see the uh, uh, high pressure uh, superconducting properties of this uh, material. This is the higher pressure form. And if we look at this graph, this will uh, summarize uh, that if you look at here, this is the temperature and this is the electrical resistance. If you cool it down, you see that electrical resistance drop and then it vanishes around 262 Kelvin. So you, you made a new material with superconducting properties as high as 262 Kelvin. Uh, it's like minus 12 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, actually in the winter day, it's almost room temperature in Rochester. So you have a new material with the uh, room temperature superconducting uh, properties. Of course, uh, there are other ways that you can verify superconducting transition. One way to do is that uh, if you apply a magnetic field, uh, in generally magnetic field are uh, like sort of like enemy of a superconductivity, it can destroy the superconductivity. So you will see, depending on the strength of your magnetic field, your superconducting transition temperature can suppress. So what you're seeing in this graph uh, on the right is that you apply magnetic field, zero Tesla, one Tesla, three, six Tesla, you see that your transition pushing towards the lower uh, uh, transition, which indicate that you're going through uh, uh, this really a superconducting uh, transition. So this gives you another indication that you're absorbing a, a superconducting transition. This is another way of uh, verifying this is that um, another property of superconduct is the isotope effect. So because the, the, the superconducting mechanism is based on the electron phonon coupling, which, are, which means that how your lattice, you know, as a full whole lattice vibrate. And if you replace with the isotope, let's say your hydrogen, you're gonna replace with the deuterium. So your vibration is different now because it's a heavier atom. So then you will see that your transition temperature is definitely affected. It should reduce to a lower uh, uh, temperatures. So with that, we, we observe that if you look at this, this graph right here, uh, so this is the temperature and this is the resistance. And you see that this is YD9, it is replaced with the deuterium that you cool it down, your resistance goes down and down and all of a sudden it disappears and goes to zero. And this is the, uh, uh, at 184 GPA, this is at 178 gigapascal. And the same conditions, same pressures, yttrium hydride, hydrogen with the yttrium, uh, yttrium with the hydrogen, has a transition temperature of 256 Kelvin. So if you add deuterium instead of hydrogen, your transition temperature reduce uh, from 256 to 183 Kelvin. So indicating that this really a superconducting uh, uh, transition. So this was great. So we found a superconductor, almost room temperature, almost close to the freezing point of water. So we were not really satisfied. So we start thinking, what are the other ways that we can uh, make a, a stable superconducting material. So with that, we start going direction that carbon can play a, uh, a important role in here. Because carbon has this property of making this uh, uh, high covalent bonded material, uh, increase in high uh, uh, four-fold or maybe even six-folded carbon. 
which can have a very strong lattice and which means that you can have a very strong uh, electron phonon coupling. So with that, we start to introduce carbon into your hydrogen system with sulfur because sulfur uh, is notorious to make these uh, very uh, uh, chemically um, very co different composition that can give rise to these uh, unusual properties. For example, H2S uh, happened to be a superconductor at 200 uh, Kelvin. So we also, carbon can be stabilized this material, which means that even if you release the pressure, it may not go back to the or, uh, original material. It may stay, stay as the high pressure form, which you can really use as a, a synthesized material to uh, technological uh, uh, developments. So with that, we start adding carbon into system. So I'm gonna show you the new material, the magic material that we made in, in, in our lab. So what you're seeing in this image is that the image through the diamond atom itself because it's transparent. And this is the carbon and sulfur mixture, this dark area. This light area, transparent area is pure hydrogen. So what we use is a photochemical technique. So I'm shining my laser, 532 green laser right here into your setup, which is your sample. All of a sudden when I shine it, there's a photochemical reaction going on and then you start to see this opaque area become transparent. See, this is now all of a sudden it's, it's really a different uh, color, right? So it's, it's getting almost uh, transparent. It's not no longer opaque. And if you keep shining this one, you start to build these different, different crystals. You start to see this, you know, a lot of movement here, you know, shining you, it's like explosion. This is under pressure. This is at four gigapascal. You shine this laser dot, you go around, you start to see this, you know, like a needle like crystals forming. Here we go. There's some needle like crystals, and now some rectangular crystals are starting to form, even right here. So now you see that this big rectangle crystal starting to appear around here. Let me fast forward a little bit. Here we go. So you see this nice rectangular crystal. It was like a totally dark area before with the laser, this photochemical synthesis. We were able to make this new material. This is the magic material. This is the material which uh, became a superconductor at uh, room temperature. So adding carbon into system, we were able to successfully get the right conditions that favor for high TC uh, uh, superconductivity. So to um, prove this uh, material is superconducting, what we did was that we study Raman and electrical resistance and magnetic studies. So this is what you're seeing here is the Raman spectroscopy, uh, Raman spectrum of this new material, which you know tells you that what kind of a bonds, what kind of a vibration of this material uh, uh, has. So before we really shine the laser, you have a carbon, sulfur, and hydrogen mixtures. So these each peak in this uh, different uh, wavelength, wave numbers represent the uh, characteristic features of these materials. For example, this is this strong sharp peak right here, represent the hydrogen. Here is sulfur, and the broad peak here is carbon. So as long as, as soon as we shine the laser and become make this new material, this rectangular material, you see that all of a sudden this peak split, there's a strong peak appear around here, and all these low frequency peaks will disappear, and there's some broad peaks, you have a totally different uh, material. So indicating that you build, uh, an, you engineer the new material, which has a, a different uh, chemical composition and different uh, uh, environment. So when you squeeze this one to really high pressures, the structure, uh, you modify the crystal structure such a way that you can have a favorable uh, uh, superconducting transition. So when you squeeze to really all the way to uh, 267 gigapascal, that's where we start to see the drop in electrical resistance uh, at 288 uh, Kelvin, which is 15 degrees um, Celsius and cl roughly close to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a chilly room, but still it's, it's you know, it's considered as a room temperature uh, superconductor. So in this graph, what you're seeing is that the pressure versus uh, temperature, uh, transition temperature, the further you go up in pressure, you start, this is go up and up and saturated, and then 
it's a quick suddenly going up all the way to a, a room temperature. So the electrical resistance study shows you that your electrical resistance vanishes, goes to zero at room temperature around 267 gigapascals. So in order to prove this one, we uh, use the two other techniques. Uh, one is uh, magnetic susceptibility measurements, which means that uh, superconductor, as I said in the before, when you apply a magnetic field, instead of it going through the sample, superconducting the material, it goes around it, uh, which means this act as a diamagnetic material. So you can measure the magnetic susceptibility, which indicate here it is going through a superconducting uh, transition. This is the signal that you observe that when you uh, go through this transition, you go this negative value of this uh, magnetic susceptibility, indicating it's a diamagnetic uh, transition. And then also, when you apply magnetic field, since the magnetic field are not really the 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 you know uh, friend of uh, superconductor, is it destroys the superconductor in general. So you see the suppression of the uh, transition temperature to lower temperature, so that uh, it indicate as a superconducting material. So if you extrapolate the data we have all the way to 6463 Tesla, in this inset graph shows you that how uh, uh, when you apply magnetic field, the transition temperature goes to uh, zero. So we, our lab, we have only up to nine Tesla. So you see even up to nine Tesla, it, it has a clear shift in transition uh, temperature because of the uh, um, uh, magnetic field being destroying the uh, uh, um, superconducting uh, transition. So this got a lot of attention. Uh, this is the first time uh, 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 scientists discover room temperature superconductor. Uh, it's been reported in the uh, a lot of uh, uh, mainstream media as well, New York Times and uh, New Scientists and BBC everywhere. I mean, if you Google it, you will uh, uh, find it. So this gives you the first observation of the um, uh, room temperature superconductor. If you look at this graph right here, this is the pressure versus the transition temperature. Almost uh, more than 100 years, this is 1911 to 2015. We were in the really low temperature region, 150, 160, that was the maximum uh, transition temperature you ever found. But in 2015, the discovery of hydrogen disulfide become a superconductor at 200 Kelvin changed the, the whole game. And people start to really think about this hydrogen as a promising material to achieve the room temperature superconductor because it's predicted to be a room temperature superconductor uh, right here. But uh, by adding other material into the hydrogen matrix, we were able to mimic the same um, metallic hydrogen properties, but much lower pressures, uh, so that uh, you can get these superconductor property properties. You know, half of the pressure that a metallic hydrogen is uh, actually uh, predicted to be. For example, CHS system, the new system that we found, is superconducting at 267 gigapascal, opposed to 500 gigapascal on pure hydrogen, and also yttrium hydride from our group. Uh, which almost a room temperature superconductor. That's again less than 100 gigapascal compared to CHS. So this tells you that we are going into the right direction. That we have a, soon we can have a room temperature, room pressure uh, um, uh, superconductor. So this uh, uh, archives the, the more than uh, a century long quest to uh, quest to find a room temperature superconductor, uh, which you know first observed in 1911. But then the the next step is that. So how we can further increase the, this transition temperature uh, in, in these materials? And then why these are lanthanum or yttrium or these kind of carbon or even sulfur? Why? What's the reason behind these uh, uh, high transition temperatures? What is the real role of hydrogen even? Um, why, how, if you do the fully quantum treatment here, how this uh, material behave, understanding of this material will, will, will change. And the, the convincing the conventional theory of BCS model, we call the Barding Cooper Schreifer model. Uh, are we really convinced this is actually the, the actual mechanism on these uh, uh, materials? And what are the other type of this kind of material that you can chemically train? And most importantly, how we can bring the pressure down to almost ambient or ambient pressure while maintaining the same. Uh, transition temperature. Those are the unanswered questions that we are actively working in our group to uh, understand now more and more. And then so hopefully uh, in the near future, we can uh, find a superconducting material which superconducted at uh, ambient uh, 
uh, pressure and ambient uh, temperature. So um, uh, with that, uh, so our focus is really onto this area right here, the top left corner, uh, the green uh, circle right here, which you know have a room pressure and room pressure uh, superconductor. I mean, some may can ask the question that you know, so what's the big deal that this is under pressure, right? You know, you you went from one extreme to another extreme. Well, um, one thing is that there was a period that we were thinking that room pressure superconductor is not even possible. It's always a low temperature phenomena. It's not going to happen at room temperature. But now that we know that it exists, so it's it's about now understanding what's the real mechanism, how this happened and these conditions, what's uh, the 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 nature of the chemical uh, chemical combustion and the what this each material is contributing and what's the real uh, mechanism. Once we understand that, we can design material with the same property, same uh, requirements at ambient pressures so that we can uh, uh, make ambient pressure uh, superconducting, room temperature superconducting material. Maybe even we may be able to grow these material. For example, diamond is a high pressure form of carbon, right? But nowadays people grow atom by atom diamond in the laboratory. So we will be able to do the same thing if you understand this one. Uh, we may be able to draw or, or grow these or design or like sort of like a uh, uh, constructing from atomic atom by atom uh, to have these uh, uh, superconducting uh, properties. So this is where the our new the, the new next research direction are heading in. And the University of Rochester, my student uh, and the other collaborators are actually now working on to uh, uh, get a material which is going to land into this uh, green circle uh, so that we can have a, a technological uh, advancement. All right, uh, that's all I have. Um, I. Um, Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions uh, you have now. Thanks, Ranga. Uh, Nick asked the question, are the novel materials stable? Um, so we haven't tested that uh, yet. The thing is that when you do high pressure experiment, you always you know, end up breaking your diamond. Um, because it's diamond, hydrogen is very diffusive. It goes into the uh, diamond and then it cracks the diamond. And also, since these are really higher pressures, when you release the pressure, even though you, you're, you know, you're releasing the, your mechanical press, they don't really, you know, uh, go in the same way. There's something called cold welding. The metal gasket and the diamond sort of weld together. So then, when you try to release it, it, it tend to rip the diamond and break the whole diamond and then you lose your sample. So we haven't been able to really test this whether it's stable or not at ambient uh, conditions. But the theoretical calculations based on all this experiment that we come up with the model uh, tells that uh, this could be a, a stable material at ambient conditions. So this is something that uh, I have to uh, understand. Um, Jeff asks, how would you scale up to usable transmission lines? Like for uh, that's a very good question. Yes. So because these are very small sample, right? Have some, you know, I mean, we're talking about like micrograms or picoliters level of uh, sample. But so I would say this: if we can understand the actual, you know, how what is the mechanism around this material. So then we can grow these material in the large scale. For example, the technique we people use is like a molecular beam epitaxy, MBE techniques, which you can grow atom by atom. So for example, CVD, vapor, you know, chemical vapor deposition, this diamond, they're growing in a large uh, scale. So what we can do is that if this is really uh, you know, stable, or if you found a way the other chemical composition that have this stable uh, uh, superconducting material, we can actually grow this one. We can like sort of like a print these material in a larger scale, like a printed circuits that can be used for um, uh, electronic devices. And to make it to level of a transmission line, if these material are, at le let's say, they're at least stable up to, let's say, 10 GPA, doesn't have to be an ambient condition, then one way of doing is this one, and then you can use the not the diamond and its cell. There are other uh, uh, pressurized cells called multi-annual cell or large hydraulic press 
or large volume press, which you can have uh, grams of material to 10, 20, uh, even 40, 50 GPA. So you can have really grams of material. You can really uh, 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 synthesize it. So then once you have that one, you can use it as a, your seed to grow more uh, to a uh, you know, l- larger scale. So it is possible to get to that uh, l- larger scale, the, you know, the, the um, quality amount that you can re- actually use as a uh, uh, practical transmission line. One good thing is the carbon sulfur, where they're very abundant and we can find them very easily. So uh, it, it, is, it is possible, but we have to find a way to really understand the, the nature and the crystal structure so that we can really uh, grow this uh, material. Tony asks, how long does it take to crack the diamonds? What, what time scale? Oh, well, it's, it's dependent on your luck. It can be, a, you know, it can happen in any minute or it can, you will have months or years in the same, you know, high pressures. Sometimes, you, you know, you, you will see, you know, there, there's a huge noise when, when diamond broke, you will hear it. And you're like, here goes $4,000. Right. <laughs> it, it can be seconds, it can be uh, months and weeks and years. Uh, it's depending on the experiment. So uh, uh, to follow up on Tony's question, if you were to grow your own diamond where you have, you could be a little more sure of the, uh, the crystal lattice being more uniform, would that, uh, you know, like a more perfect diamond, would that be a better way to go? Um, so yeah, perfect diamonds, so what we are using actually is synthetic diamond. Uh, in our lab for this experiment. But the the problem is that not just being a perfect diamond. Um, so even though we polish this diamond, you have this, all these, you know, the, the the orientation we need, we cut them to one zero zero direction. And then we polish this diamond. But still, if you look at, uh, you know, on, on, under the you know, STM or something, you will see this uh, surface scratch, surface roughness. And you see some tiny cracks in there, which you, if you look under the microscope, you don't see it, but in a STMA or TEMA image, you will see it. Hydrogen is really a difficult sample to study, very diffusive, especially at room temperature. So the hydrogen will find these tiny cracks, you know, which we don't see it in our neck, even in the microscope, and it goes into the diamond and then make a carbon hydrogen, and then no longer you have the same level of a strength and then break the diamond that's you see that yeah. diamond becomes just half or something like a powder yeah. goes like that yeah, it's yeah. a chemical bond and you don't know where it's going to happen the diamond uh, yep so what we do is that we we put it like a diffusion barrier uh we apply a small barrier onto the diamond tip so that we, we can delay hydrogen diffuse into the diamond so that we will have a little bit longer time to uh, study this material Jeff asks, uh, is the conductivity primarily surface conductivity or through the pipe? This is a bulk conductivity. Yeah. Not if it's a um, bulk. That's awesome. Any other questions? Tony second question. So this is pretty exciting. Oh, uh, Tony didn't hear the answer to the, que- to the to the questions. You kind of broke up a little bit. Oh, which question is that? Is the uh, how does it crack? The uh, the is the conductivity primarily surface conductivity or through the? Through oh the yeah, sample? I mean it's it's not surface conductivity. It's a bulk uh, property, so it's a whole material oh, is whole it's a, it's superconducting. Yeah. Awesome. Bulk property. Mark Dudley's typing. Ken asks, can you name one or two commercial applications? So if he can get, a, you know, the ambient pressure one. So I would definitely easily put my money onto the uh, making uh, electronic devices with the superconducting material. So I would imagine going from, uh, uh, you know, semiconducting society to superconducting uh, society. So we can have a huge impact on uh, computing, you know, your electronic device, your smartphone or whatever oh, you're yes. using there. I, I could see, I don't know if you got how many people watch the, the show, The Expanse. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Are you familiar with the Ranga? You watch The Expanse? Uh, no, no. <laughs> and, and, well, 
in the expanse, this, is, this takes place about 200 years in the future, but they have these portable devices like phones that are transparent and they're huh. able to get images and you know, there, there's a lot of capabilities, very similar to a cell phone, only a little more advanced. But I could see where you would have that kind of a really, yep. you, know, you make, you make, uh, that kind of a device possible where it's it's plastic or or pl looks like it might be plastic glass transparent and yep, you exactly. all, this, all this circuitry that's practically invisible yeah <laughs> definitely yes even with the quantum computing nowadays you know you use these superconducting qubits so imagine you know you can have a room temperature all these supercomputing then now the quantum computing is happened at millikelvin right because they that's where these uh, superconducting and you need all these cryogenics to run it but if you have room temperature superconducting qubits so here we go so you, you can think of this as you know um, back in days our computers like a size of a building right then nowadays our classical computers it's it's, it's on your hand same way now the quantum computing is in a range in a, in a huge uh, device but that can uh, uh, dramatically change and then, of course, other application, you know, um, transportation because of this magnetic levitation, that's a huge impact. Um, and medical imaging, I would say that's that will be a very well uh, useful to get into the medical imaging uh, without the cryogenics, say MRI machines or other imaging system that people use as a superconducting magnets uh, will be very beneficial. Yeah. But yeah, I bet you can get even better resolution because yep. of that. Yep. Mark asks, uh, is there any estimate as to when this could be realized commercially and what cost if it could be scaled up? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, well, we start a company called Unearthly Materials uh, with the direct focus on uh, making an actual product, superconducting material ambient uh, uh, conditions. Um, so, I mean, we're hopeful that... Uh, Within within next five years, five to ten years, we will probably be able to really have a large amount of this material at ambient pressure. So the the, the challenge right now is is bring the pressure down. I mean, scaling up all those things can, can be done easily if we can bring the pressure all the way to uh, ambient. So that's that's no problem. The scaling up part it's a it's a question of how we can keep the same superconducting properties but at ambient pressure. So that's the challenge. So we have a new research uh, working on that direction, which we have very promising uh, results. Uh, hopefully, very soon. Uh, uh, yeah, five years, please. That's 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 pretty quick. Yes. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, Mark also, Mark also asks: Is there any geographic concerns, like uh, rare earth materials that are found only in some countries? <clears throat> yeah. Such that they have newfound valuable resources. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I mean that's that's a one. Yeah, that's one issue with this rare earth material. That's why we were starting to think the other directions, uh, and then you know come up with this carbon and sulfur. Which, you know, you can find it very easily, and it's but it's cost. We can keep the cost uh, really low. Um, so I think the rare earth material. It, it's it's great that it happened to be a superconducting at high temperatures. Uh, in terms of you know keeping the cost down and finding it, uh, th there will be a lot of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, so, but the, with the tannery compounds such, such as carbon and sulfur, may be a solution to that kind of uh, um, uh, issues. Um, uh, and then the one th good thing about the carbon and sulfur is that it it make a different document, different composition, right? Chemical compositions. We start with the one-to-one -one mixtures of carbon and sulfur. We haven't tested the you know different compositions. There may be a trick that you know with the different composition, maybe uh, your pressure that you needed to have, get to this room temperature may be different, maybe lower. So these are the direction that we wanted to test that such so that we can sort of uh, uh, really find a low pressure uh, room temperature superconductor. Um, I, I think as of now we are very much focused on these uh, low C materials, something like carbon sulfur, uh, not really a rare earth uh, uh, material because of the difficulties of uh, even handling those material are extremely difficult, very reactive. Yeah. Jeff asks, is, is anyone experimenting with literally using tunability for some application? I'm not sure what he means. You mean the, for room temperature properties? For superconducting? I mean, room temperature superconducting properties, I 
tone. Like, I mean, since we this is the first time, and then still is happening at high pressures. Um, I do not know any you know experimenting, you know tunability or anything like that. But I know for a lot of uh, you know the low temperature, there are a lot of uh, uh, scientists who are testing this uh, uh, superconducting material, but happen at low temperature for different you know, between the current and how much current that you can use so that depending on the, that, uh, you, you your transmission line, even, you know, making the transmission line, you have to have a high critical current because if you send too much current, sometimes the superconducting transmission is goes away, it's disappear or it destroyed. So then you have a limitation. So you have to tune some of those parameters uh, so that you can get these optimum uh, conditions. I think at low temperatures, people being you working on the tuning these even the chemical composition tuning and other parameters but um but this material as far as i know no i mean now since this published i'm sure other researchers are working on it but uh, as of now i'm not aware of uh, any anything like that yet do you expect to find any analogous materials that might perform yep. as well or better yeah what you're yes. saying yes that's yes that's, yes. that's Definitely yes. We were thinking the same line. There are the similar type of material that you know, maybe carbon, not carbon, maybe silica. Very similar. You know, if you look at in the the periodic column, this is in the same column. So silicon and maybe selenium, so which is heavier. Uh, your pressure that you needed to go to this condition may be much lower. So yes, exactly. We were thinking on that direction, and then that's where we have some new promising results. That's a very good question. We got lots of sand. Yeah. <laughs> Tony asked, "Do you have any major competition in this area of research?" Yeah, yeah. There's uh, yes. So it's a good group in Europe and uh, Japan. Uh, they really are working hard, and then a uh, couple of other groups in US. Uh, yes, it's it's a race, especially the German group. That's we are really competing. Uh, uh, yeah, we are very secretive in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Competition breeds success, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any patent filing? This is from the lawyer, of course. He's, he's asking. Yes. He asked about it, patent filing yeah. efforts so yeah. far. We, yeah. we patent three three patents so far. Uh, for this, uh, you know, the new material, and then how to make this one in large quantities, what techniques to use, and uh, yeah, we have three. Uh, UFR, um, they they did file three patents. Yes. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, congratulations. This has been a, a, a huge success. Hopefully, yes. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> any, any other questions, group? So now I had to get the licensing from UFR for my own invention to my own company. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's great. You, you invent it, right? And then uh, U of R has to have their, their piece of the action. Yeah, I mean, it. everything we do that's is awesome. belongs to U of R. So that makes, sense. Have, that makes yeah. sense. They funded all the research. Yes, yeah. So we had to get the license uh, from them. We are in a negotiation uh, stage. Well, congratulations, Ranga. That's phenomenal. Oh. You and your team have done a, a tremendous thing. And it was, and for, you know, we're, we're very much astronomers. We like to look up at the sky, but certainly, we're, or were there some technology geeks yep. amongst us as well? So this was a really interesting talk to me. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Well, appreciate it. Any, a last last call for any uh, any questions or concerns or ideas from some the crowd? Typing some some type. Yeah. You're going to get a lot of thanks and congratulations. It yeah. looks like. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, and I really enjoy. Uh, discussing uh, our research and probably well, appreciate a in some of the astronomical events. Well, I appreciate your uh, your joining us tonight. Thanks, Ranga. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good night. Have a good weekend. Good night. Good night. I'm here if anybody wants to talk. Any other questions, concerns? Mark, are we going to need to do stuff to get the computers back at the site up and running since the power was off? Uh, no, it, typically they'll, they'll, everything will boot back up. You can probably go on to the site right now and everything will be, you can be able to just look at the cameras and everything. It looks like power was out for about an hour and a half.
Fair enough. Yeah, and, and this happens often. I, I lose power probably three or four times a year, and it's, it's, it's generally about an hour or so. I don't usually lose it long. I think only once in the nine or ten years I've lived out there have I lost power for more than a couple hours. We should be fine. Well, thanks everybody for coming and thanks uh dave pesh and dave bishop for getting this thing going i was i was in a panic at 6 15 my power goes out i'm like oh, what am i going to do i gotta host the meeting and i have no power <laughs> thanks for picking up the the pieces and i want to thank peter blackwood for uh, for hosting me at his house so thanks peter i'll have what peter's having yeah <laughs> All right, with that, I will uh, close the show. Good to see you guys. Glad to see you. Uh, glad to have a few minutes with you. Or, uh, I thought this was an interesting talk tonight. A little off the beaten path, but uh, should be fun. And then next month, we'll have uh, we'll, we'll find out what's going on with the James Webb Telescope. It's been delayed so many times. I think, I think originally it was going to go up in like 2017 or something. It's finally, looks like it's going to go up in, I think it's October this year. And we'll get... Uh, We'll get some more information on uh, what you know, what it's all about, where it's at in its uh, in its uh, cycle, of getting up into space, and where it will be in space, all that kind of stuff. So, thanks everybody. Have a great night. Have a nice weekend. And those of you who are going to brave the cold, enjoy. Stay warm. Good night, everyone.